Okay, so why am I making a video essay about a 70s picture book series? Well, it's autumn. It's time to get a little cozy, a little nostalgic. Here's my six-year-old signature. These are antiques. And I know these are basic little books that taught us how to read, but I want to use it as a basis to discuss bigger ideas. An English professor, Dr. Rosenberg, actually uses them in her class. At first, all her students think they're way too simple to possibly gain anything, but she considers it a good lesson in critical literacy and analysis especially since you're forced to dig a little deeper. And if that's not enough, the book's author said all of the frog and toad stories are based on adult preoccupations, really. I was able to tilt them somehow so that a child could appreciate them too. But I think that adults also enjoy them, and I think that's probably why. It's because they're really adult stories, slightly disguised as children's stories. Also, this is just a silly little video on YouTube.com, like, whatever, it's fine. Frog and Toad touched on a bunch of concepts I've been trying to internalize. I think it's easy for a lot of the lessons they try to teach us as children to just go over our heads. But there's gotta be a reason these little stories stick with us for decades. So yeah, this is elementary level self-help. In this video, I'm gonna explore the author's vision, the themes in the stories, and look into why Frog and Toad is so cozy and wholesome. The Frog and Toad series is four books, or easy readers, published throughout the 70s and written and illustrated by Arnold Lobel. I realize he has one of those names with a bunch of different pronunciations. Lobel. 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 But thankfully, this handy website has author recordings. Hello, I'm Arnold Lobel. Growing up in the 30s and 40s, Lobel was bullied and isolated as a kid, kept to himself a lot, and even had a period of prolonged illness at one point. But he was good at telling stories to his peers, so much so that teachers asked him to take over and tell a story when there was nothing else going on and they wanted the kids to stay still. As an adult, he got his start illustrating for other authors, like nearly a hundred books. He actually preferred illustrating to writing, but eventually wrote and illustrated a few of his own, though he didn't really get recognition until Frog and Toad or Friends in 1970, when he really decided that instead of trying to figure out what kids would like, if he was going to be a writer, he was going to be like any other writer and have it come from within. And he was pretty surprised by its success. In one interview, he said, I really don't quite know what I'm doing. The interviewer responded, some part of you knows. And he said, no, really not. Which, you know, mood. Of course, the characters themselves, the eponymous frog and toad, were the key to his success. And by the way, I'm gonna be using clips from this 80s claymation. I'll let you decide if it's cute or off-putting. What a fine garden you have, frog! Speaking of, Lobel watched a lot of TV with his kids, especially comedies. And the frog and toad dynamic is very clearly inspired by that classic comedic duo, in the vein of Abbott and Costello and Bert and Ernie. Personally, I think of Toad as the George Costanza of children's literature. He's a bit neurotic and cranky and overthinks, and much like with Squidward, the older we get, the more we realize we're more like Toad than we thought. Lobel seems to think so too, remarking that Toad is like most of us. He knows the limits. He never goes over the line. There's always a certain logic to everything he does. He's irritated because he's looking for something that he hasn't found. He's the kind of person who, if something goes wrong, goes to bed. I don't know who Frog is in comparison, but he's the inverse of Toad. He's more chill and cheerful and outgoing, so they form that lovable and familiar balance. Lobel found comfort in children's books even as an adult, and felt the good ones ultimately had more to offer than just pretty pictures. And he's right. It seems kids are often most impacted when they're not condescended to, or put another way, not treated like children. At least, those are the kind of stories I remember most. He didn't even use controlled vocabulary despite it being an I can read book. I think ironically this all stems from his not really knowing how to talk to kids. Though he wished the best for children, it didn't really mean he wanted to be around them. And he often declined speaking events. He pointed out that some of the most notable children's authors were in the same boat. Quote, Maurice Sendak has never been within two feet of a child. And Hans Christian Andersen was a fussy, prissy, old maid of a bachelor. And I don't think he would have children anywhere within 10 miles of him. So yeah, you don't need to love children's company to write for or care for them. And Lobel did care for them. He loved Frog and Toad most for their accessibility, which was accomplished mostly in three ways. One, they're cheap so schools and kids could get them easier. Two, he said using animals brings it to everybody, and they belong to everyone. Rich, poor, white, black. It seems this sort of inclusivity was pretty important to him, maybe at least partially because he was gay. He came out to his family in the mid-70s, and this has led some people, including his daughter, to speculate that Frog and Toad was about a little more than friendship. 
I can just hear Alex Jones in the distance. Return the friggin' frogs gay! This interpretation brings an added sweetness to the stories, but also melancholy since he spent most of his life closeted. Sadly, he only lived semi-openly for a few years before passing away. You can find a patch for him in the AIDS memorial quilt, made with love by school kids who treasured his creations. Using animals also made it so they could act somewhere between child and adult. They didn't have to be bogged down by the limitations of being too young, or the limitations of being older with boring responsibilities. Lobel said, You can give animals the freedom of adults while they still maintain the attitudes of children. I think children feel very restricted in their lives. They're surrounded by boundaries. Life is a prison, really, for most children. And they feel a release when they read stories about frog and toad who don't have parents. But who are children, really? Their preoccupations are those of children, yet they have the freedom of adults. Also, just in a general sense, he thought stories about loving mommy and daddy in white suburbia and all the little domestic problems were just overdone and boring, and that kids didn't care about that stuff. That brings me to the style and setting, the charming drawings of a little forest life with deliberately muted aesthetics, only using greens and browns, which is rare for children's books since they usually use plenty of bright colors. Lobel was trying to capture a particular experience of nostalgia, a sense of cozy security and safety. He talked about how as an adult, you want to create a feeling of well-being for kids, whether or not you feel it yourself. That no matter how nightmarish you feel the world is, you want to kind of hide that away for them. And eventually that sense of protection becomes part of you too. That's the root of the warmth in Frog and Toad. It's safe, it's happy, it's stress-free. It's freedom from the weight of everything. In that interview I referenced, Lobel mentioned, I'm very careful in the stories not to make any direct allusions to modern life. That's something I just sense not to do. Frog and Toad don't call each other on the telephone. Toad takes a walk and he visits Frog. He could, I suppose, pick up the telephone and call, but that would be too much. The world would be too much with them. Even in 1977, that was too much. And now it's 10 times as much. Sometimes existence right now just feels like endless noise. And Lobel sought out to recreate the tranquil feeling he got from children's books, what he described as the comfort of crackers and warm milk. It's something we touched on in our video on Ghibli films. That slice of life feeling, wanting so badly to just hold a moment in your hands and just live there. That longing for some abstract idea of comfort and rest. Maybe you miss something you can't quite articulate. Maybe it's a feeling or a moment in time, or both. So I think it's relevant to note that when I talk about a simpler life, I'm not really talking about the cottagecore aesthetic that blew up when the pandemic started. All those pretty fantasies of idyllic, isolated countryside living. Though one could argue Frog and Toad fits the criteria. Sometimes people took it a little too far and advocated some picturesque, off-the-grid ideology. Romanticizing rural life and kind of ignoring that a lot of the real-life conditions associated with it is just poverty. Like the closest I've gotten to simple living in this sense is spending some summers growing up in my mom's small town in the Dominican Republic. You had the outhouse, raising chickens, no AC, lots of mosquito nets, and rolling blackouts were the norm. I have fond memories of playing outside all day with my cousins, but like I also had a Game Boy and I got to go back to an objectively easier life in suburban America come August. So yeah, I don't hope to present some delusional idea of rural ecstasy here. Even the advantages in Frog and Toad's lifestyle were pointed out in Dr. Rosenberg's paper. After some consideration, her students would start contemplating that not everyone has pretty cottages in the country, nor do all people have fine china or leisure to sit in front of a fire sipping wine. Frog and Toad are very middle class, but that secure suburban life with its amenities is so thoroughly ingrained as the default North American life, even though many people do not actually possess it. Lobel even admits as much. Quote, it's all very bourgeois, aka bougie. There's a lot of furniture, a lot of accoutrements of the home, because that's what I am. All that being said, I think the average person who enjoys cottagecore doesn't really mean any harm by it and are generally aware that working a farm and tending a productive garden are actually pretty difficult. And I can understand the core sentiment behind the movement. It's escapism. People want to rest from all the hustle and commotion. They want to be able to say, actually, I don't want to be productive right now. I don't have anything to prove. I just want to appreciate life as it is for what it is in this moment with small things that bring me joy. They want to stop the noise. 
So hopefully in a bit we can pluck out the more realistic and practical aspects of the simple living cottagecore fantasy and apply it to where we're at right now, since you know, we can't all go live off the land. When we look at Frog and Toad's cozy laid back life, it's enviable. Lobel describes it as a sort of domesticity, nostalgia for this kind of snug security. It's inspired by his own upbringing. He says, quote, I'm really a very domestic kind of person. I guess that comes through in the illustrations in most of my work. I'm really not much of a traveler or wanderer or adventurer, and I think that feeling certainly comes into my books. I notice that all of my books are rather homebound. I'm a small adventurer. There's also the sense of introversion. He mentions that being raised by his stoic German-Jewish grandparents equipped him with a very reserved and withdrawn personality, not the kind to embrace other people easily. I'm sure introverts and extroverts alike see the appeal of this kind of space, but it's especially irresistible to the former. In the article The Frog and Toad Stories of Arnold Lobel, A Psychoanalytic Perspective, the author remarks that as meaningful as the pastoral world of Frog and Toad is, there's meaning too when we move inside their cottages. The sense of snugness, smallness, and aliveness that recurs in popular works of children's literature is very present in the Frog and Toad books. Here, there are no intrusions from the outside world, teapot, clock, and books accepted. Chairs are ample and rounded and usually drawn close to a blazing fire. Cozy domestic interiors are, I believe, another example of internal space and for Toad especially they provide a womb-like refuge. It's notable that Toad's home is where most domestic scenes take place, and when there, it can seem as if we're inside Toad's head and his unconscious fantasies. Okay, so we get why these books feel good and safe and happy, provide all these pleasant feelings. But what else is going on in the narrative? Because as a 1988 article put it, being lighthearted is not the same as being lightweight. The first story I want to talk about is actually the last one. It's called Alone, and all the themes we've kind of talked about up to now about appreciating simple joys and all that are laid out pretty beautifully here. Toad visits Frog's house and discovers a note on the door. I realize I'm basically doing kindergarten story time with a bunch of 20 to 30 year olds, but just roll with it. The note says, Dear Toad, I'm not at home. I went out. I want to be alone. Obviously, Toad wonders why Frog would possibly want to be alone when he has a friend like Toad. He looks for Frog everywhere and finally sees him sitting on a rock in a river. He figures Frog must be sad, so he makes lunch, goes back to the river, and hitches a ride on a turtle who wisely asks, If Frog wants to be alone, why don't you leave him alone? And Toad, of course, takes this to mean their friendship is over, so he shouts out all kinds of apologies before falling into the river. After Frog helps him out, he explains he made the ruined lunch for Frog so he'd be happy. Frog says, But Toad, I am happy. I'm very happy. This morning when I woke up, I felt good because the sun was shining. I felt good because I was a frog. And I felt good because I have you for a friend. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to think about how fine everything is. Toad agrees that's a pretty good reason. And now Frog's glad not to be alone, and they eat lunch together. In a video a long while back, I talked about the Greek philosopher Epicurus, whose philosophy of happiness was less rooted in indulgence and excess, and more in a modest life soothed by community and day-to-day -day pleasures. Frog saying he's happy about the sun shining, about being alive, about having a friend, these aren't things you can go out and buy. They're not things you can really achieve in the classical sense, but they're always the most important. And to sit down or take a walk and think about that, or even write about it, is probably the center central tenet behind having a balanced, simpler life. Next story is called Spring. April has finally arrived, so Frog visits Toad to wake him up from hibernation and force him outside. The sun is shining, the snow is melting, wake up! Frog describes all the things he's looking forward to doing with Toad now that it's springtime. Skip through the meadows, run through the woods, swim in the river, count the stars in the evenings. You can count them, Frog. I am going back to bed. But instead, Toad goes back to bed, asking Frog to come back next month. So Frog rips off the pages in Toad's calendar until he gets to May. He shows Toad and convinces him to come outside at last. So the takeaway from this one is sometimes you have to lie to get what you want. Not really, I just wanted to talk about getting outside. You know, that whole touch grass concept. I get the phrase will be overused if it isn't already, but it's a very necessary sentiment. You've heard it before, but we're not equipped to take in so much information and opinions at all times. It distorts our perception of people and makes us lose touch with reality. Embracing nature on a regular basis helps bring your mind back down to earth, more so than a YouTube video probably could. 
As Mary Oliver put it in Upstream, come with me into the field of sunflowers is a better line than anything you'll find here, and the sunflowers themselves far more wonderful than any words about them. For the nature in Frog and Toad, Lobel drew on his childhood memories of summer spent in Vermont, where he often kept frogs and toads as pets. I also played with them a lot as a kid, spent a lot of time in the dirt. Not too long ago, I helped a frog get out of my car. Pretty sure it was an American green tree frog. It hopped on my wrist and I just kind of like watched it for a while before I put it in the grass. I still think about that frog like once a week. <laughs> So yeah, nature is comforting and can remind you of how magical life can be. So try to take a weekly walk or visit a park. Now that the weather is getting cooler, you can sit outside at a cafe, whatever's convenient. Just get out there if you can spare 10 to 20 minutes. You can also look at all those cool James Webb telescope photos. Remember how big the universe is and how small we and our lives are. It can be reassuring to recognize most of the little stuff we worry about all day isn't that important. This next story is called Tomorrow. In it, Toad's house has become a mess, and as Frog points out all the chores Toad has to do, he keeps putting them off until tomorrow. Until he realizes the amount he's put off, and starts fretting about the day to come. He says, well if I do this one thing, I don't have to do it tomorrow. And that snowballs into the next little thing, and the next. Until he's finished and feels better, and says, now I can save tomorrow for something I really want to do. So something that's helped me form better habits as I've gotten older is treating future me like a friend. And it doesn't just have to be about keeping my space clean. It can be if I exercise today, I'll be in a better mood tomorrow. Or how about I don't impulse buy an item and save up for something I value more. I want to make life simpler for tomorrow's version of me. So like Toad, I can just take life easy. I mean, it's never going to be easy, but at least there's small things I can do to make it go a little smoother. And I love the idea of one small task at a time like Toad did, where he could have stopped at any point if he chose to. It makes it feel less overwhelming, just taking it one tiny step at a time. I guess that sort of leads me to the next story, a list. Toad makes a list of all the things he needs to do that day. I'm pretty jealous of this to-do list, my dream life. I love that he wrote wake up and immediately crossed it off. Okay, so he goes down the list, crossing off what he accomplishes, until a wind blows the list away. He refuses to do anything for the rest of the day because he doesn't have the list to guide him. As night falls, Frog jogs his memory and he recalls that go to sleep was on the list. He writes it in the sand, crosses it out, and they fall asleep together. The story was inspired by Lobel's own habits. He described himself as a compulsive list writer. So what I've decided to take from this is to not put too much stock in the plans you've set for yourself. Or at least not so much that if it doesn't go right, it paralyzes you from taking action in a different direction. Dr. Rosenberg points out that ironically, Toad endows the physical list with far more significance than the activities it describes. And I think we often do that, sometimes with to-do lists, sometimes with more general life plans. We become more obsessed with the planning and achieving than the outcome itself. Because even if you do reach a goal, you'll just move on to the next, and then the next. An endless cycle of productivity. You'll never be satisfied. And I think a big part of a simpler lifestyle is being content with the here and now. Not that you shouldn't have goals, but that they shouldn't be the sole measure of your self-worth or enjoyment of life. In the next story, Dragons and Giants, Frog and Toad wonder whether they're brave like the people in fairy tales. We look brave. Yes, but... Are we? To test their bravery, they try stuff like climbing a mountain and exploring a dark cave, and in the process avoid a snake and an avalanche and a hawk. They run all the way back to Toad's house and compliment each other's bravery, while Frog hides in the closet and Toad hides under the covers. And I'm happy to know a brave person like you, Toad. Quote, they stayed there for a long time, just feeling very brave together. I thought this one was worth mentioning for a couple reasons. One, because like Dr. Rosenberg put it, it interrogates the conventions of romance and fairy tales in which those who fight dragons and giants are never afraid. Reality is dangerous, and fairy tales, this story suggests, don't give helpful information for how to deal with that danger. Frog and Toad, however, do show an appropriate response in running away from danger. As a kid, every time I read about children in fairy tales doing really cool stuff, I thought, couldn't be me. So this story really validated that scaredy cat part of myself. I'm not afraid. I'm not either. Whoa, let's get out of here. <laughs> But also I wanted to bring up a Lobel quote. You could ask, what is the difference between a child and an adult? I think a child probably goes through all the same kind of struggles. I don't think we lose anything when we grow up. We think that we're adults and that our emotions are adult, but we're really just going through the same kind of thing that we went through as children. 
Maybe we were more open about revealing our feelings when we were children. I think this idea pairs nicely with this story, speaks to how we're raised to suppress the softer sides of ourselves, the parts of us that are scared or lost or weak, and instead of expressing that's how you may feel in the moment. It's a little random, but I think part of living a simpler life is accepting that these maybe less desirable feelings are inevitable. Sometimes they're worth examining and deconstructing, and sometimes it's fine to just let them be and let them pass. A grounded, manageable life isn't just about curating your surroundings, but getting more in tune with your thoughts and emotions. You may have seen memes about this next story, cookies. Toad makes a batch of cookies and takes them over to Frog's house. They eat a lot of them. Frog says, let's eat just one more. And after that, Toad says, let's eat just one more. And so on. Frog says they need willpower to stop. Willpower is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do. And they try to stop themselves. They put the cookies in a box. We can open the box. That is true. They tie string around the box. But we can cut the string and open the box. That is true. And they put the box up on a high shelf. But we can climb the ladder and take the box down from the shelf. <sighs> that is true. Finally, Frog takes the cookies outside and lets the birds take them away. We have lots and lots of willpower. You may keep it all. I'm going home now to bake a cake. I'm gonna take this as a commentary on consumerism. In regards to this story, Lobel said, when you take a simple situation like that, trying to check a compulsion really, you touch on the whole range of things. I guess it lends itself very perfectly to a whole aspect of fighting with oneself, and that can be for any kind of habit, gratification that one feels is bad for one. Materialism and constant consumption have become the norm. Whether you give in or not, there's a non-stop pressure to buy and spend, so it can often be difficult to feel content with what you have. Even if you've had plenty of cookies, there's always a new cookie to eat, even if just for a moment of fleeting pleasure. So when people think about minimalism, they often picture a bare, colorless living space or getting rid of all of your possessions. So the whole concept kind of turns people off. But of course, there should always be a balance. Somewhere I read the phrase, willpower is useful, but joy is essential. I'm going home now to bake a cake. Trying to curb consumption in its many forms, the actual core of minimalism, is really about being conscious and deliberate with what you choose to bring into your home and into your mind. If something genuinely makes you happy, then it serves a good purpose. You just have to determine what those things actually are. The dream feels a little different than the others. In it, Toad's having a dream he's in costume on a stage, and Frog is the lone audience member. Presenting the greatest Toad in all the world. A disembodied announcer presents Toad's various talents, playing piano, walking on a high wire, dancing. All the while, Toad boasts to Frog, asking him if he can do all these things. You do tricks like this? No. Frog always replies no, growing smaller each time, until he disappears completely. Toad cries out for Frog and silences the announcer. Come back, Frog, he says, or I'll be lonely. Toad wakes up from the dream to Frog standing nearby. Toad looked at the sunshine coming through the window. Frog, he said, I'm so glad that you came over. I always do, said Frog. Then Frog and Toad ate a big breakfast, and after that they spent a fine long day together. This story reminded me of Lobel's stated reasoning for ending the Frog and Toad series. He felt there was a certain cruelty in the relationship, that Frog was controlling and Toad was controlled. He didn't really notice this dynamic until maybe the third book. But this story seems to show an earlier example of pushback from Toad, of trying to have the upper hand for once. Lobel based the story on a friendship he had with a person obsessed with one-upmanship. There's a tension in that kind of relationship. And if you don't fight it, especially because you care for them, you may feel as though you're shrinking. In the endless quest to achieve societal ideas of success, we may lose sight of the relationships right in front of us, those who accept us as we are right now. A lost button is pretty self-explanatory. Toad loses one of the buttons on his jacket and spends the whole day trying to find it, with the help of Frog and a bunch of other forest critters. This is not my button. After being presented with a bunch of buttons that aren't his, Toad finally loses it and just goes home. Whole world is covered with buttons and not one of them is mine! <laughs> where he finds his button on the floor. He realizes he'd been making a fuss all day over something that didn't really matter, all the while ignoring that everyone was trying to help him. So he sews all the buttons onto his jacket and gives it to Frog as a gift. 
So in this, of course, is the element of appreciation, especially when people help you or put up with you in the times you're being extra. The button had been there all along and so had Frog. So had everyone. Toad realizes this after he had a moment to cool down, and he chose to express his gratitude for Frog's patience and concern. It's a wholesome moment, and a reminder to acknowledge the people in our lives we often take for granted. It reminded me of a passage in one of my favorite books, which is coincidentally titled Who Will Run the Frog Hospital. Quote, I often think that at the center of me is a voice that at last did split, a house in my heart so invaded with other people and their speech, friends I believed I was devoted to, people whose lives I can only guess at now, that it gives me the impression that I am simply a collection of them, that they all existed for themselves but had inadvertently formed me, then vanished. But what? Should I have been expected to create my own self? Out of nothing? Out of thin, thin air and alone? That brings me to the last story I wanted to talk about. The surprise. It's October, and Frog and Toad look out of their windows to see that the autumn leaves have fallen. They each make a plan to go over to the other's house and surprise them by raking the leaves. They head over on separate paths, see the other isn't home, and get to work. As they each head home after a tiring day, a gust of wind blows the leaves everywhere again. They get home to their messy lawns, planning to rake for themselves the next day. But they're pleased about how surprised the other must have been to have gotten home to a neat lawn. That night, Frog and Toad were both happy when they each turned out the light and went to bed. I love this story for its sense of imperfection. I vaguely remember being a kid and frustrated by the idea that nothing came of their hard work. Like, what was the point? You're kind of forced to consider it beyond they did a nice thing and it paid off in the end. The point wasn't the outcome of a job well done, but the pure implication of the act itself, and the resulting joy that comes from being there for someone you love. In a New Yorker article titled Frog and Toad, an Amphibious Celebration of Same-Sex Love, they try to determine meaning in this story. Quote, at the end, Frog and Toad's altruism has amounted to nothing more than the feeling they each got from it. What does a child learn from this? That doing good deeds can make the doer feel good, even if those deeds go unrecognized? That those to whom we feel closest will never fully know how much we care for them? I think it's a mix of both, though most especially the sense that love was there and that that was enough. Okay, so I actually didn't tell the whole ending for the first story I mentioned, Alone, which like I said is actually the last story in the Frog and Toad series. After Frog helps Toad out of the river and explains why he wanted to be alone, Frog and Toad stayed on the island all afternoon. They ate wet sandwiches without iced tea. They were two close friends sitting alone together. I thought there was a sort of poignant finality to it. A peaceful, perfect farewell, with Frog and Toad facing away from us and looking out into the horizon. You just knew they'd go on to have plenty more little happy adventures. As far as their relationship, I think Frog and Toad can be considered in every way. Partners, best friends, siblings, parent and child, the two halves of you. Just as their colors complement each other on the outside, their nature goes hand in hand. When asked which character he's most like, Lobel said both. Both. I think everybody is both. He went on to say, at the time, it was important for me in my creative process to go inward and to start writing about things going on in myself. I wanted a mouthpiece for myself. I wanted a dialogue to go on between two characters who were essentially me talking to myself. You may have noticed, but most of the stories revolve around Toad's anxieties and preoccupations, and how Frog guides him and helps him overcome them. I'm so glad you came over. I always do. In the same sense, we need our frog half to comfort and nurture our toad half, to learn how to cultivate that sense of peace, so we can step outside when spring comes again and the sun is shining. And that alone could make us happy enough. Hey y'all, thanks for watching. I didn't have time to talk about all of the stories, so I'd love to hear your interpretations of ones I didn't cover, or which ones are your favorite, or if you drew different conclusions than I did. I probably didn't say anything you haven't heard before in terms of self-help, but I don't know, it's fun to look at this advice through the lens of Frog and Toad. And the ideas bear repeating anyway. If you enjoyed this video or any of our other videos, we'd really appreciate it if you considered supporting the channel on Patreon. It's just two dollars, it helps us in a lot of ways and we're getting closer and closer to 50 patrons so we can start posting bonus content on there much more regularly. Check it out if you can. Hope your October is nice and spooky and cozy so far and I'll catch you guys next time. Bye!